a great pleasure to introduce my friend Peter Mayer. He comes to us from South Africa, and uh, Peter is the head of pediatric orthopedic at the Grace Hospital in South Africa and an honorary clinical fellow in the Department of Orthopedics at the University of KwaZulu in Natal, South Africa. Peter, welcome, and uh, please take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. And I'm going to be covering the principles of pediatric um, amputations. I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. So um, statements like this one, any fool can cut off an arm or a leg, but it takes a surgeon to save one, reflects the disdain or speciality carries with us for the performance of an optimization of, of an amputation. And I just want to echo what the previous speakers have said, that, you know, limb optimization is really where we want to focus. Uh, we know this isn't true. A well-executed amputation is a reconstructive procedure rather than a surgical failure. And if we can achieve the goals of a pain-free stump, which functions optimally with acceptable cosmesis, we can really uh, make a vast improvement to an amputee's life. Uh, people like uh, Pride Mafira and uh, uh, Bethany Hamilton show us that we're capable of much more um, than we think, and often um, a large, uh, large limitations to our potentials are, are actually self-imposed. So what are the principles? We want to preserve length at all costs, um, even if that means uh, needing to do advanced soft tissue reconstruction and able to maintain functional length of a stump. We want to preserve growth plates um, and we want to uh, disarticulate rather than performing transosseous amputations. Always try to preserve the knee joint and then extend some mechanism if possible. And we may need to stabilize or normalize the proximal segment uh, like with super hip procedures in uh, a PFFD classically. And we want to uh, pay appropriate atten general attention to the child and the social circumstances, his family, financial constraints, all of those things when we, when we, when we plan um, this sort of reconstructive operation. So what are the indications? Uh, congenital conditions, certainly. Um, uh, trauma, specifically in low and middle income countries, we really have a, a major problem with road traffic accidents, frequently patients presenting to us with mangled extremities, vascular injuries and compartment syndromes, rarely infections, and of course, malignancies are ubiquitous. So mangled extremities, the decision uh, whether to amputate or reconstruct is difficult. Um, we always try and do it as a multidisciplinary team considering the principles of life before limb. We always try to be uh, conservative if there's any doubt. Um, in our institution, uh, access to high quality prosthetics are not uh, universal. Um, and there's also a cultural reluctance to accept an amputation. And therefore we always will try to reconstruct the limb, um, definitely in pediatric age group. But we understand that there is a transitional age at around 10 to 12 years when uh, these injuries start acting more like the adult counterparts and, and there's less, uh, less potential for, for uh, functional limb. The MESH score may be helpful, but as in adults, it's better to predict which limbs we can save and it's less useful to, to predict which limbs should be amputated. Vascular injuries are particularly different in children. Again, uh, we always try to use a multidisciplinary team to make a decision and the collateral blood supply is key here. And a classic example is that of the um, uh, supracondylar distal humerus fracture, where um, a, pulse, a pulseless limb that's pink uh, with a well-perfused hand uh, doesn't necessarily mean it needs uh, exploration and vascular repair. And the same thing may happen in the lower limb as well. So clinical assessment should be, caref should be done uh, carefully. We should not only look at the pulse, but also at the capillary refill and distal perfusion. Um, Doppler evaluation may be very valuable if available, and advanced imaging such as CT, uh, CT angiogram may also be very helpful. Um, when vascular uh, exploration and reconstructions um, have to happen, it's always as part of a team with the vascular surgeons determining level of viability or performing the vascular repair or reconstruction. We uh, step in to perform internal fixation of fractures and joint spanning external fixation. The timing uh, of these surgeries are sometimes controversial, but at our institutions, patients, patients generally present late. So there's no time to waste and uh, we want to shorten the time of um, impaired perfusion and therefore the vascular surgeon always starts with the vascular repair or reconstruction. 
if a reconstructive amputation has to be performed, it's uh, in the purview of the orthopedic surgery department. Looking at the levels of amputation, we, we want to be as distal as possible. Uh, the Symes amputation being the most preferable, better than a transtibial amputation, which is uh, better than a through knee amputation, uh, and a, than a transfemoral amputation, and a hip disarticulation being least desirable. Um, why don't we want to perform transosseous amputations? And that's for a variety of reasons uh, overgrowth or exostosis, uh, problems with inadequate stump length, developing advent, uh, painful adventitious bursa, a stump coning may need to be uh, performed, and frequent socket liner replacement may become expensive. Overgrowth is a local phenomenon. It's important to understand that it's not prevented by proximal epiphysiodesis. Um, the diagnosis can be made if the patient presents with pain or prosthesis intolerance, and one should really be alert to this and warn patients about this as well so that they volunteer this information before pressure ulceration, uh, skin perforation, and infection uh, occurs. You really want to prevent having uh, chronic osteomyelitis in the stump. Surgical strategies uh, to prevent this have not been universally effective. Um, however, uh, one technique that's been described is, is uh, using autologous cartilaginous caps. And this may be done at the time of the amputation or at the time of resection of the heterotopic ossification. Um, donor sites are uh, distal or proximal fibula, metatarsal heads, calcaneus, and of course, the iliac crest is always available. Now, when one performs an amputation, you'd have to look at the, the classic teaching of how long a functional stump should be. Um, and this is at skeletal maturity. Of course, there are variations with more modern, uh, modern uh, prosthesis, uh, prosthetics. You can uh, cheat a little bit here. You can perform reconstruction to lengthen a short stump. But our goal should be a transradial um, amputation 14 centimeters from the olecranon and a transtibial amputation 15 centimeters from the medial joint line. I want to stop for a moment at the Symes amputation. I think this is a very, uh, very functional amputation. It's potentially weight bearing and it's end bearing when a prosthesis is worn. It's no risk for overgrowth and with a mon modern prosthesis, uh, um, uh, ankle joint can also be incorporated. So the aim of the Symes amputation is to use the um, multiseptate heel fat pad uh, to bear weight on, um, and that's really the great advantage and why you can actually walk on that. Um, some tips uh, in terms of performing it, you want to trim the malleoli in the child uh, to prevent any pressure areas there, preserve the posterior tibial vessels, only divide them at the flap edge after they've divided into the medial and lateral plantar arteries, avoid the temptation to neaten the flap. Um, one of the major problems is the, the, the flap um, or the heel fat pad migrates posteriorly, and one of the strategies to prevent that is to make sure to have a robust suture of the plantar fascia to the proximal ankle capsule. Um, some authors advocate using a K-wire uh, to, to pin the flap to the distal tibia. It's not something we routinely do, but it, you can consider that and always close over a closed system suction drain. Through knee amputation, and it's also our, our go-to, much, uh, much preferred to a, uh, to a transfemoral amputation. It's an end-bearing stump with preserved thigh musculature and maximal length, and it can uh, modern knee hinges can be accommodated. Patients with uh, through-knee amputations have been shown to have less pain than an above-knee amputation and better prosthesis tolerance. We perform, typically perform the classical uh, through-knee amputation um, with a long anterior skin flap and a posterior suture line, but depending on the tissue available, you may need to do a posterior flap, a fish mouth, or even um, local flaps to, to get closure. Um, the patella tendon and PCL are transected distally. The MCL and uh, LCL are divided. Menisci excised, popliteal artery is ligated, the level of the knee joint, and the patella tendon is sutured to the posterior cruciate ligament. So what does the future hold? Uh, um, Osteointegrated implants for transfemoral amputations seem to be a game changer. It certainly is a space to watch, and we're always on the lookout for advances in upper limb, amput uh, upper limb prosthetics uh, with potential for neural integration. Um, but while we are waiting for, for, these, um, for these advances in prosthetics, uh, one of the biggest things that we can change is the, the outlook and support to um, patients who suffer amputations. And this is uh, Mklingi Gwala, 
um, he will be representing South Africa at the Paralympic Games in Paris later this year. Um, and that's a goal that, um, that he's been able to achieve that uh, was certainly, certainly would have seemed inconceivable at the time of his tragic um, limb loss. Um, but it's important to recognize that that's only possible um, if you're part of a supportive community, uh, have a positive outlook and a dedicated team of healthcare providers. Thank you.